Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, also a production of Israeli News Live. Wanted to share with you an incredible message today about the two witnesses. Is there biblical proof that can actually define whether or not it is the literal Moses and Elijah, or is it two people anointed with their spirit? Uh, we have found an incredible revelation, or I should say an incredible revelation was revealed to me today. And of course, it was very biblically sound. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But before we do, I want to share with you the website here, www.pesach17.com. This is the website Brother Kellen Davison has put together about the conference that we have in Israel on March the 28th. And if you would like to support that work, we do encourage you and ask you to please be a part of that. You can go to IsraeliNewsLive.org and contribute there. Help us cover the cost on this. Uh, Israeli News Live is covering the venue where the meeting is being held on Mount Zion. Uh, and as well as helping us to get there, things like that. Uh, we just, we do appreciate your support in doing so. Just to kind of give you an idea, those of you that are able to attend, some of the speakers of the, uh, the event here, uh, one will be Rabbi Yehuda Glick, the Temple Mount, uh, Temple Mount activist. He's also an MK member of parliament there in Israel. Ari Abramowitz, co-founder of the Land of Israel Network. Uh, David Neckrutman, Executive De De Director of the CJCUC. Uh, Merv Watson, Israel-based musician, Catacombs in Production. Uh, Mikael Ben David, Israel-based Israel musician, Emet Zion Music. And Kimberly Rogers Brown, Bible Prophecy An Analyst at Hebrew Nation Radio. Myself, Stephen Benun, journalist and author with Israeli News Live, and of course, my lovely wife, Yana Benun, who's also a journalist for Israeli News Live, as well as her own channel, Rise Up Children of God. So you don't want to miss this. Uh, again, if you'd like to be a part of it, just go over here to Israeli News Live, and, uh, and you can be a part of that with us there. It's also israelinewslive.co.il. Uh, you'll see right here on your right-hand side of your screen a, a place where you can donate. It, 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 accept, it accepts all types of credit cards, so whatever you need to do. Some people have said that they do have a difficult time trying to get through on that. If that's the case, email me, stephenbenoon at gmail.com. We have been using AOL, stephenbenoon at aol.com for a long time. We are having trouble with this email account, so if you've been emailing us there, uh, I apologize, we've had trouble with that for quite some time. Uh, anyway, getting right into this message, again, it is going to be a blessing and no doubt a shocker to many right here. Let's start with Revelation chapter 11. This is what sets the stage for the two witnesses. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years based on a 360 day year calendar, uh, something that uh, the, the Jewish people did use at one time. Uh, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now notice God calls them two witnesses. He doesn't say Moses and Elijah, but he calls them two witnesses rather. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's from Zechariah chapter 4's prophecy. Don't let that slip your mind. We're going to go there in just a moment here. So these two witnesses are the two olive trees, all right? Uh, the two candlesticks that are standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. Remember Elijah, when they send up the, the military to try to take him before the king. And he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. And of course, we know the case two different times. It happens. The third set of men that come up, they were a little bit different approach there, come up humbly, and therefore God spared them. Uh, it also states in here, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Again, 
clearly, we see Elijah and Elisha, in fact. Elisha also another one that could stay the heavens of the rains or cause it not to rain. Uh, and, and we saw this with Elijah and Elisha as well. We see that uh, the turning the blood, uh, to, to, excuse me, the water to blood, clearly a gift of Moses. Uh, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. That again, Moses and Aaron, the things that they did down inside of Egypt when all sorts of plagues were being uh, brought about. Now, now let's quickly, I, I would like though, before we get into this, I want to just share with you something here uh, from, the, from the Mamre Bible here, the, the Hebrew Bible there. Uh, we'll run over to Exodus here. Something I just like to share with a lot of people that when we think about Moses being one of these two, uh, uh, witnesses, because there are those that believe that it's Elijah and Enoch. I'm not going to slam that, but today we're going to find out, is it literally Moses and Elijah, or is it literally Elijah and Enoch, or is there scriptural proof? We're going to go into that in a moment, so bear with me. I'm going to take you down the idea that it is actually the, the spirit of Elijah and Moses, and you're going to see why in just a moment. And just for a good example right here, we have I'll turn with you here on the screen. Then sang Moses unto the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. Even in English, we know the word I will is something that is yet to have happened, correct? So he says, Az Yashir Moshe, Uvene Yisrael, et Hashira Hazot la Yehua, ve yamru, okay, ve yamru le mor, okay, Ashira la I will sing. Even in Hebrew, it is a future tense. Something that Moses said he's going to sing about, what the horse and his rider, all right? For he has highly exalted the horse and his rider and hath he thrown into the sea. So we find out that the Antichrist that rides in Revelation on these horse riders here is finally thrown and cast into the sea, into the depth of the sea. And Moses says, that's a future event. Now you have to remember when Moses is singing the song and he says he's going to sing this song, Az Yashir Moshe Uvanei Yisrael, he's going to sing this song that God has gotten victory over this horse and over his rider. But at that time there were 600 horses with riders. So wait a minute, another horse, another rider? It has to be clearly a prophetic event. Also, we find in, uh, I believe it's Exodus 34. Let me just double check to make sure I got this right. Um, keeping, let's see, let's see here. Said, if I have found grace in thy sight, or let, let I pray thee to go into the, okay. And he said, behold, I make the covenant uh, before all thy people. I, okay, here it is. In Exodus 34, 10, right, right here. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do. Marvels is not the correct word to translate here. It should be wonders, okay? Nephilot, right here, the word wonders in Hebrew. But the rabbis admit they changed the translation to marvels in English because they said Moses had already parted the Red Sea. Moses had already... Uh, done all the plagues in Egypt, and yet from the time here of the Ten Commandments until till Moses' death, he never did anything greater than the parting of the Red Sea. So they put the word marvels, but watch what he says. And he said, Behold, I will make a covenant. This is God speaking to Moses. Before all thy people, I will do wonders, nephilot, not marvels, such as have not been wrought in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord that I have I am about to do with you. That is, it is tremendous, right? Now look at it in Hebrew here. Nipolot or say is to do, all right? Ashar lo nibaru bechol haaretz, okay? Now, u bechol hagoim, okay? In front of all the Gentiles or all the nations. Vera a koha am ashar, okay? Ah, all right? And all the people among which you are shall see. All right? Now, it's not just necessarily the Jews of that day. Ashar atar bekorovo, bekorovo, excuse me, et maose yehua ki nore 
הוא אשר אני עושה עמך. Right? So God is going to do something with Moses, wonders that have never been done in all the earth. Right? Observe thou that which I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am driving out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perzite, and the Vite, and the Jebusites. Take heed to thyself, lest, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, let they, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee. Now, see, now God is saying that he's going to go to this land. He's talking about the promised land. He said it would be a snare to him. But we already know that God had already said he wasn't going to that promised land. Why? Because he smote the rock the second time. So see, something doesn't seem to line up here. What is it? It is a prophecy that Moses is to fulfill that he is not fulfilled, just like in the case of Exodus 15. And even Rashi, the great Torah commentator, states this about Exodus 15. He says, no doubt Moses must return during the Messianic age because he speaks about a future event that is yet to happen in the song that he would sing. And so I agree with that. Now, so we jump back over here to Revelation, and we see that uh, it, ha it speaks of the same types of gifts that Moses has, and of course that of Elijah. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, excuse me, in the street, not streets, in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem, all right? Now, why do they call it Sodom in Egypt? I think it's because of the fact of uh, the, the dividing of the land and the things like that that are happening. All right, and all the, and all the kindreds and tongues of the nation shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall suffer and, sh and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall sing gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Now, notice what it says. They lay in the street for three and a half days. Why is this happening? Because you remember the story when Yeshua was put in the grave and then they made up this uh, fantastic story that Yeshua was taken, his body was stolen away, and the soldiers were paid great sums of money to lie about this, and it become nothing but, a, but, but an open stench before the world that the New Testament was fabricated. Uh, and this is a story, as, as it says in the Gospels there, that is repeated unto this day. Well, this time the Lord is going to show the resurrection power once again, but yet it's not going to be hidden in a grave. It's going to be where CNN, Fox, and all these other propaganda machines out there will be able to film it and actually show their bodies laying in the street dead for three and a half days there. Kind of interesting, too, the little boy Nathan, how he prophesied those two dead guys that raise up over there uh, on uh, the Mount of Olives, this is when the Messiah comes after that. So I know there's some people think that, well, the young man didn't say anything that was correct, things like that, that a lot of things that he said didn't come to pass. Don't forget, he said that Obama would bring the nations against Israel. Is that not so? I mean, the way they interpreted his vision could be one thing, but remember what happened. Obama orchestrated the 70 plus nations that came against Israel. They signed that new uh, uh, new uh, UN Resolution 2334, which was effectively putting the entire world against Israel. And when it said, he said in there that they would also go to war with Russia, the United States would, in Syria, we found out that's exactly what was happening around Aleppo. The U.S. military had 250 army soldiers fighting alongside with al-Nusra. No, they didn't report that in Western media, did they? They sure did not. And that's why there was such a major hoopla down there at the United Nations when former uh, Russian foreign ambassador Cherk in there was making a strong stance and Miss Samantha Powers comes in all freaked out over this trying to bring an end to the war there in Syria because why? Their soldiers were cornered. See, Russia and American soldiers were actually fighting against one another inside of Syria. So think about things now. Never know what's going to happen, but just think about these things as we see things unfold here. So anyway, we, we, we build this case up here. Now, a lot of people want to say they like to take you over here to uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and they say, well, brother, let me tell you something. You have to realize it cannot be Moses and Elijah as the two witnesses. It's got to literally be Moses, excuse me, Elijah and Enoch that come back because they both translated and they've not died and the Bible says and it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment and this is the argument that a lot of people make now 
let's first clear, let's clear this whole mess up right here because this here has nothing to do with you as an individual or Moses or Elijah or Enoch, okay? If that be the case, all of you out there that, that use this as your argument that believe you're going in a rapture one day, I guess you gotta come back and die yourself again, don't you? No, okay, look, look, come on, it's ludicrous. Look at what the scripture is saying. Read the whole chapter, but let's just use verse 24 to 27. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, figures, but into heaven itself now to appear into the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself, what? Often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. In other words, the priests year by year were bringing in the sacrifices there, and they did it over and over and over. Yeshua didn't have to do it. How many times? Offer who? Himself. He didn't have to offer himself up yearly, right? All right, so it says, For then must he often, there's a, there's a logic behind it, for then must he, Yeshua, Jesus, offered, have, have, have suffered since the foundation of the world. In other words, he'd have been doing this over and over and over and over. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto, that should not even be plural, man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. In other words, he came as humankind, mankind, one time, so it has nothing to do with any other man but Yeshua. So anybody that tries to use this as a cop-out for Elijah and Enoch, my brother, sister, I love you, but it's totally wrong. You, you can't take the word of God out of its context. Now remember though, over here in, in Revelation 11, what did God say that these two witnesses were? He said, these are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. All right, they are the two olive trees. That's Zechariah chapter four, and we're gonna go right to the heart of the matter because Zechariah is blown away by these two olive branches. He, he sees it from the beginning. He sees them on either side of this golden lampstand. And by the way, remember uh, the golden menorah, it also is a type of an olive tree. What did Yeshua say? I am the vine. He also says, I am the root. I am the vine. In other words, he's the main stalk, the root that goes in the ground. He says, but you, are the branches, right? All right, so the golden menorah is a beautiful type of Yeshua, the root and the stalk of the tree there, and the branches are his children, see? But then there's this beautiful type here of these two olive trees on either side of this golden lampstand, and they're emptying their oil out. Watch what it says here. And I answered the second time and said unto him, what are these two olive branches? One place says olive trees okay, which are beside the two golden spouts, all right? And they empty the golden oil out of themselves. What does oil represent? The Spirit. It's the anointing of the Spirit. So what do these two golden these two olive branches do, they are emptying the oil out of themselves. The menorah has no oil of its own. It receives the oil from the olive tree itself, which Yeshua is that olive tree as well. And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You remember the beautiful picture in the movie about Yeshua when he was on the earth and he goes to Mount Transfiguration and there Yeshua standing there as the golden menorah and on either side appears Moses and Elijah. They are what? The two anointed ones that stand by who? The Lord of the whole earth. There was, your, there was God showing you who the two olive trees were. How could we miss it? They are the Moses and Elijah standing there. But notice what they do. They pour the oil out of themselves. In other words, the anointing, the spirit of almighty God that is in them is poured out and it's going to come on to others. So when I tell you Moses and Elijah are already here, they are. All right. Now, get, let's look at an example, beautiful example of this. What do we have right here? 
We have Elijah in the book of first Kings chapter 19. Let's just jump up here real quick where God speaks. He says in verse 13, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave and behold, there came a voice in the helm and said, what dost thou hear Elijah? Eliyahu is his name in Hebrew. All right. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts and for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. I even I am only left and they seek my life to take it away. All right. This is what people try to say about the Jews living over in Israel today. They can't be the true Jews. They hate Jesus. They don't like they don't like Christians and they spit on us and everything else. They're blinded. Do you not remember what Paul said in Romans 11? See, don't be high minded. Give them a chance just because they don't believe the Baptists and the Methodists and everything else. You know, let the gospel of God come to them through his anointed ones. You know, not to say that there's not some that are believing. There are. We got many that are following this ministry here that are believers. Follow it right now. All right. But there's still coming a great awakening. And when it does, it's not just going to wake up Israel in in the modern Israel today, it's going to hit a global revival around the world. All right. So let's, let's carry on here. All right. So the Lord said unto him, go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, thou shalt anoint Hazel to be king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, remember the prophet Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of uh, uh, Abel, Micholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet, will they put on there, in thy room. In the Hebrew right there, it's techat, 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 the, the root of the word right here, techat. Techat is in place of, it doesn't, it's not like a bedroom. In other words, he takes your place. He is a replacement. He will take your place. So what is he to do though? He's to anoint him. What does those two olive trees do? They pour out the oil. They are anointing. You see, it's the anointing of that prophet is coming out and pouring out and coming into Elisha. Right? And that's what happens on the two witnesses. That's why it doesn't say Moses and Elijah over there or, or even or Elijah and Enoch. It just says the two witnesses and gives you the same anointing that was on Elijah and that was on Moses so you could identify the anointing when the time comes of who it is. Okay? And now you have it right here. So what did Zechariah say? What did, what did the angel say to Zechariah? These are the two anointed ones and they're pouring out their oil. See, that spirit, that anointing that is upon them will be poured out of them and on two individuals in this day here. And don't think that the two witnesses are active as of yet either. They're not. When God causes the anointing to pour out, you will see a revival break forth amongst the Jewish people in Israel first because why? The house of Judah has to recognize their sin against Yeshua according to Zechariah 12. Then it will spread across the globe. Israel, who has not even come home yet, that is globally, will wake up all at once. That's why the Bible says it said 10 of the nations will take all the skirt of a Jew and say, show us your ways. For we hear God is with you. Ain't nobody running around saying we hear God's with you right now. In fact, if anybody, they're saying, like it says in the Bible, where is the God of Israel? Because why? There's no anointing fallen yet. All right? So it shall come to pass that, uh, as well, we, we can stop. Now let me just share. I, I got to share one thing with you. Do you, you know what? This is so incredible right here. Look right here. This is something maybe you don't even, I, I just saw this today myself. Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, all right? Now, he's the son of Shaphat. Shaphat, by the way, when we look right here, Ben, all right, so you have the Et uh, Eliashua, Ben Shaphat, Shaphat, like judgment, okay? The judgment Me'aval from Abel Mehola, Mehola. Chole, right there, is patient. Isn't it interesting? God says in his word over here in First Peter, excuse me, Second Peter, he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that, that all should come to repentance, right? 
all should come to repentance. What? So a thousand, uh, one day with the Lord is, is yet but a thousand years. So God takes and he uses Elisha where the anointing oil is going from Elijah to Elisha and it just so happens that his daddy's name means a judgment from Abel and that he's patient. See? What does it say in Genesis? Abel's blood crieth out from the earth. God is long-suffering, but he's not forgotten. Okay, not forgotten. And that's, Elisha is only a type. Elisha is a type of what we saw in Zechariah 4. All right, because see, Zechariah came even after Elijah. But even then, it was showing right there, the two golden olive branches, right? Now, but let's see, I think up here it calls them olive trees. Let's go back up to the top here. And he says, and he said to me, what seest thou? He said, I have seen and behold a candlestick, all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and seven lamps thereon. And there are seven pipes, yea, seven to the lamps, which are upon the top thereof. And two olive trees, okay? Two, uh, two olive trees, one on the right side of the bowl and one upon the, the left side thereof. And I answered and spoke to him, the angel said to him, what are these, my Lord? And then we find out later when you get down here that they're the ones that are pouring out their, their, their oil. Pouring out their oil out of themselves. Representing the anointing in the spirit of Almighty God going upon another. And Elijah gives the example of that when God tells him to go and what? Anoint Elisha. The Spirit of God, the oil, the anointing oil coming off of Elijah onto Elisha. And in this day here, when God is about ready to have a, you know, a global revival starting in Israel, that anointing is ready to pour out of the olive trees and pour onto the two witnesses. I think it's an amazing thing. Never saw this before. I always realized, well, maybe it will be actually Elijah and Moses. Or when I even was willing to say, good, well, maybe it is uh, Elijah and Enoch. Because I knew the argument about Hebrews 9. But I also knew Hebrews 9 was totally taken out of context. Because it only applies to Yeshua. If you were to say that it's only appointed once to man to die, and then after this, the judgment, as far as it per pertaining to individual people, then you have to ask the question about, well, what about Lazarus? What about all the other people in the world that have died more than once, two or three times? Uh, cases like this come back and, and live again. But we have it biblically in the case of Lazarus. We have it also at the time where, uh, what was it, the, the man that was dead and everything, they threw his dead body over on Elisha's bones there, where he'd been laying in the grave there, and the man came back to life. What about him? Doesn't he have to be... How why did he come back twice? He's only supposed to die once, remember? No, it applied to Jesus. And that's clearly what is shown in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 when you look at it in the context in which the, the words are given there. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching uh, Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. I trust this has been a blessing to you. Again, don't forget, if you're able to come, we would love to have you there uh, at the conference there in Israel. Uh, wonderful conference that, that, that we're putting on there with Brother Kellen Davison. Um, I know Kel Kellen's original website was David Star Magazine, but he's actually got a different website. The event will be at the Harp of David. Uh, just to share with you where this is actually being held at, this is the location of the event inside of Jerusalem there. This is actually right across from the upper room. And oddly enough, the place where we do the meeting at is on the upper floor. Uh, and that kind of odd there? And so anyway, uh, we are limited. If I'm not mistaken, the, the, the place sits 120. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny in itself as well. So we would love to have you there. So we do have limited seating. If you'd like to be there, please uh, take an email us. Con right here on the PASOC 2017 website is where you would do the contest. Contact, contact us. When it says get tickets, there is no charge for the event there, but you need to be able to email um, uh, Brother Kellen on this so that we know that you're coming uh, or click on there for the, for the free tickets there because we, we are limited on the, the seating that we have there. Uh, but I uh, would love to have you be a part of this. And again, if you would like to contribute to it, just go to IsraeliNewsLive.org uh, and 
right here on this side here, there is a place where you can donate at. If you have any trouble, even leave us a comment here in the video below if you're having trouble being able to, to be a part of that. Uh, we're just getting closer to have reached our goal there, but we're still a little ways out. It's a very costly endeavor to put everything together. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the New Institute of Biblical Research. If it airs on Israeli News Live, I trust it's a blessing to our friends there on Israeli News Live as well. Shalom. Thank you.